if she's proper, um, do us if any people come, do we have some seats, you know, I, I assume they'll notice them here. Um, I did tell them the card room. Uh, so hopefully they'll come earlier than I told them. <laughs> Okay, well, I'll stretch the lies, okay? <laughs> Is that all right? Um, this, so I'll just stretch the lies, so okay? Sure. All right. I'll try to help you out, okay? Um, first of all, Liz, I got to know her through our church, and um, I, I can say her a friend. Uh, she's a very sharp lady, a lot of things, and uh, you know, I'd like that she likes structure, and you can imagine why. So I'd like to start out with, first of all, this young lady was born in St. Petersburg, Florida, and she was raised in Largo, a Ridgecrest community at Largo, Florida, is where her, her family and her group saw. And um, I can't tell you enough about some of the things that she's done since she has been retired. As you know, when you retire, you're busier now than when you were active. And this, this lady is always busy. It's hard to get her. When I look at her calendar and I see every day, you know, and I've been pushing, and we were trying to get her to December and we pushed it back and I, I prayed that she'd be able to do it today. And I saw her calendar in February. And there it was, and it, it was the only date that she had written in there, and all this other had already been filled out. So I'm so pleased that she was able to come, and we did have a snowstorm or whatever. So let me tell you a little bit about her. Um, she shares some wonderful stories about many of her trips that she takes as a result of what she does in terms of the um, eight triple six group. I think it's just amazing the travels that she does and all the people that she meets. But we also see a side of her too. Uh, she locks her cancer. I can't tell you the number of miles that this lady has walked in different states and has supported raising funds for cancer. She has, I think her family has experienced that, that horrible disease and she uses her energy to do that. And I keep on saying, she's military. That's why she can do all that. <laughs> I can do that. I have to have somebody push me in a chair, I think. Um, the things that this, this lady has done, she volunteers at our church. Uh, I always go to her sometimes to communicate with her because she's had some experiences that I had not had. And she'd say, we don't want to do that, or we don't want to touch it. She's a good source of having a good sense of what's right and what's wrong. And there's no in between, there's no gray area. Okay. I think that's part of the military that made it right, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my first experience with her um, in terms of doing a presentation, she did it with children in our church. And I'm telling you, it was spellbound. And the kids were like, like this. I mean, they just, she can just do it. I mean, she can go from there to here. So my own personal experience, I'm hoping that you will all go away with a lot of information and see that she has worth the time to stand and listen to her and share some of her, her memorabilia here. This lady has been very instrumental. I mean, she is a door knock. And she is one of these people who she adopts something she's going for. She was able to get a bill introduced so that the ladies were recognized with the professional medal of honor, which just happened just recently. And I know that when I first introduced the idea of having her come, some of you bell started going off in your head because you had read some newspapers. And you kind of said, yeah, I think maybe that would be a good idea. So at any rate, she's very instrumental of that. And she can get, you know, through all kinds of things and contact people. She's very good for that. She also was at Fort Leavenworth uh, presentation of a monument that was established in these ladies' honor out in Kansas. 
And so, again, she's all over the United States. You'll see her in the newspaper. And she just shared with Gwen and I, there's a, a book here. And she just turned to a page and she said, you recognize anybody on that page? It's her. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting how she's so busy. And um, I just think that there's so much that she can share with you. And I'm hoping that afterwards that she can ask all those questions that she might like to share with you because she really can, can make it so exciting and knowing that uh, it's a little late for us to recognize this group of women because we don't ever hear that much what women did in World War II. I mean, and we're shocked and we think of segregation. Uh, we hear a lot about the Black airline pilots that came from Tuskegee. But we certainly didn't hear anything about the women. And she is in their kitchen to get it across. So at this time, I'm going to leave the floor to my friend Liz. I hope you enjoy her, her visit with us. And please feel free. And she's going to introduce her two sidekicks um, <laughs> that, that are helping us today. OK? Liz, you're on, girl. <laughs> Mail call, mail call, Corporal E4, Bobby Jones, Tree, Johnson III. Mail call, here I am. Mail call, Sergeant Hackett. Mail call, PFC Buddy, Joe Lewis Jones. Mail call, PFC Buddy. Joe, Lewis, Jones, mail call. Yes, sir. Mail call. Mail call. Two Lieutenant Charlie, Bobby Smith, mail call. Sergeant, mail call. Mail call. Miss Kathy Browning Douglas. Mail call. Thank you, Sergeant. Mail call. Private Robert Skippy Smith. Mail call. Mail call. Mail call. Mail call. Mail call. Sergeant David Little Brown. Sergeant. Mail call. Okay, that's it for mail call. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Elizabeth Ann Helm Frazier, Master Sergeant, U.S. Army retired, six AAA supporter, Berwyn Presbyterian member. Thank you, Doc, for inviting me. Uh, we've been trying to plan this, I think, for a year. Uh, yeah, you got my calendar. It's like, you got to tell me so I can like, pencil it in. Uh, but first, I want to introduce, like Doc said, two of my road dogs partners. Uh, first, Cynthia Williams, her dad was a army veteran. Cynthia lives here in, in Laurel, she's been a really great friend, and she's on the AAA team. Uh, the person that's doing the recording is the IT person. <laughs> her name is Stephanie Mitchell. She is US Army retired staff sergeant. Okay, and she's on the six triple eighteen. Stephanie and I are actually in the same Army Women's uh, Virginia, Northern Virginia chapter thirty three uh, group. So again, thank you for those of you that didn't get mail and it made you feel. Yeah, that's I I will tell you that I did this to a group of kids at my church. Okay, and did. The, Similar the same thing. And the ones that didn't get mail, they was pretty pissed off. <laughs> okay. So imagine World War II. There was no Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or none of that. The only way that you knew what was going on back home was by what? Mail. Mail. Letters. 
And of course, you know, your mama, and you know, I'm not being present, but your mama was the one that sent all of them packages with cookies, cakes, brownies, whatever, okay? Imagine not getting in your back over two years. What was going on? World War II. And service members, being a soldier, I will tell you the three most important things to any service member, getting paid, food and shelter, mail. You can have a bad day and mail or that moment would make you forget about your bad day. Imagine today not being out your telephone, your cell phone. Try taking it away from your kids. <laughs> it just pass right on out. Okay? They, they would rather you just, just go ahead and just hit me or something, but don't take my phone away. Okay? Same concept. Imagine not getting any mail. You don't know what's going on. Back home. That's a morale. I can tell you, because I'm one of those soldiers that really can, can testify to that. One year, I was stationed in Germany. My birthday is September 14th. I didn't get my stuff, my birthday card, my birthday cake that my mother had baked me until like September 17th. I was mad. <laughs> Okay, I'm in Kaiserslautern, in Germany. I call my mother and say, where's my car and my cake? I don't have it. Oh, well, I just mailed it like yesterday. Yesterday? Oh, I was mad. And I presented to tell her how I felt about that. Good thing I was on the phone. You know, I'm 3,000 miles away. I knew she could do that to me. Okay. <laughs> but I let it know that it was important that I got my birthday stuff on my birthday or before my birthday. Lo and behold, that didn't happen to me. Okay. <laughs> the 6888 Central Postal Directory Battalion was a predominantly all black female unit that served overseas from February 1945 to March of 1946. It's predominantly black. But there were, there was one lady that was Mexican American, there was one lady that was Puerto Rican, and there was one lady that mother was Australian, and her dad was a black soldier. In World War II, black women recruitment was limited to only 10%. So-called matching the population of U.S. African-Americans at the time. The Army still was doing the segregation policy. President Truman had not signed it yet. Total African-American women serving during World War II was over 6,000. Now, let me be clear. The 6888 Central Postal Directory Battalion was not the only women serving overseas. They were the only women in a battalion size unit serving overseas. That is the distinct difference. A battalion is anything over 500, is a battalion size company. In 1942, it was the Women Army Auxiliary Corps, the WAAC. It became the Women's Army Corps. There's a difference. The WAAC did not have official military status. In other words, they could like say they was in the army, okay? They, they just didn't get paid to be in the army and they did not get veteran status, okay? The Army Women's Corps replaced the WAAC. It was signed by President Roosevelt on July 1st, 1943, 
it gave women who served in the military, military status. They were veterans, they were getting paid, okay? And they could go overseas. The WAAC did not allow women to go overseas. Now these women who was serving, they had two pretty powerful advocates. One of them, this is a test. Oh, did I tell y'all it's gonna be a test? <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be a test. <laughs> One of them was First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. The second lady was Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune. She was one of the most powerful black women in the country at the time. They were advocating not only for officers, but enlist women to be recruited into the army, okay? Now, there were units of white women already over in the European command. So if you hear me say ETO, European Theater of Operation. You know, in the military, we got a whole lot of acronyms. So every now and then I might slip up and say an acronym and I'm see what that means. Okay, so that's what that means. In November of 1944, the War Department finally consented to allow the recruitment of 824 enlisted women and 31 officers. And they were taken from at the time, all of the services, okay? This particular thing is going to create the 6888 Central Postal Directory Battalion nickname, 6888 motto, no male, no morale. Now, why was that? Why do you need a specific unit to just do mail? Because like I said, remember, third most important thing, mail. That's going to be a question. Mm -hmm. and, and troops, and I can tell you, because I've been a troop, Stephanie been a troop, okay? Cynthia is a, a family member. They can tell you. A service member don't get no mail. Oh, they'll stop complaining. So in, 19, in the 1940s, service members were complaining to the adjutant general. We're not getting mail. I can't do my job. I need to hear from home. You know, my mama sent me a box five years ago. I ain't got it. I need to hear from home. Leaders were listening to this. There were other units doing the mail, but just could not keep up with, with the load because what was happening? World War II service members and civilians were moving all of the time. Nobody stayed in one place. So people were moving all of the time. And in the military, every time you move, you had to fill out a locator card. It's the same thing, you know, when you go to the post office and you move and you got to fill out that card, okay? With this post office, you hope that they get it. Okay? <laughs> but in World War II, they were called locator cards, five by seven cards. And you had to fill it out. You had your name, your, your rank. And at the time, they had serial numbers. You had your previous unit and the unit you was going to. And you signed it and turned it into the clip. Okay? Now, some people had like eight, nine, ten cards because you were moving. Every time you moved, you had to fill out a card. Okay? But the morale was so low that the surgeon, the adjutant general had to say, okay, we need to do something about this. Because, you know, you got Billy Bob worried about the wife who got, like, three kids that because he got drafted and going to the Army, left her at home with three kids, okay? He needs to know, okay? Or, or Bucky over here and heard from his mama, and she missed his birthday, and she never misses his birthday. So, you know, that, that was a real morale killer. Six triple eight was established. The leader was a lady by the name of Captain Charity Adams. Now I could do a separate talk just on her. Outstanding. When I say strategic, she was a strategic planner. 
She was. She had already been in the service. She was out at Fort Demone, Iowa. She had already commanded troops. As a matter of fact, she had the most time for commanding troops, uh, women, than any other person had on at, at the time. Charity Adams is right here. This photo right, that's her. She was a young captain and she and her executive officer, Captain Abby Noel Campbell, got selected for this assignment. They didn't know where they were going. Finally, they got to, got to England and she tore open her uh, letter and it had her orders in it. And it told her she was gonna be the commander for this male unit. Their first duty assignment was going to be Birmingham, England. If you're looking at a map, you look, look at London and go northwest. Birmingham is about an hour and a half from London. Okay. That's all the males when it left the United States. Okay. Oh, by the way, APO. That's, that's not a state. <laughs> APO was Army Post Office, okay? When it left New York Harbor or left San Francisco, it went to the England or out to, I think it, I think it was China or some place. I don't know what that's Anyway, the mission that the army had come up with, army leadership, white male general officers said, okay, we need a unit to just do the mail. Just do mail, the only thing that they were gonna do. When it was decided that it's gonna be a all female unit and then a black unit at that or predominantly black, the army gave them six months. Not because they thought they needed six months, they thought they were going to fail. Think about this, we're in World War II, Who, who's the leadership? White, male, and what was going on in our country? Yeah. First, first duty assignment, Birmingham, England. All the mail was going there, it had been going there for over two years, okay? Like I said, there were other male units, but they just could not keep up with packages. And I have a couple of pictures here um, that shows you what, what it looked like, okay? From the floor to the ceiling. That's how male was, because it was just coming over. And at the time, Birmingham, England, was a army airspace. So the plane was coming, they just dumped mail off and putting it in aircraft hangers. And there are a couple of pictures here, okay? And it was just sitting, okay? Now, it had mail, packages, packages had what? Food and other stuff that your mama sent. Because most of the time it was your mama that sent that stuff, okay? <clears throat> the, the aircraft hangers was full of undelivered packages, Christmas packages, birthday packages, all, all kinds of stuff. Now, in World War II, what was the literacy level of most people? non high school reps. So, you know, they, they called you what they called you at school. Robert Buster Smith, okay? Joe Lewis Brown, okay? Junior. I mean, okay, I think I need a little bit, a couple of juniors, okay? And how many Smith Jones, Johnsons, how many of those are in, in the world? Hold on. By the way, for the people that got the mail, you can open up your mail too. Okay. <laughs> okay. So mail was 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 hurting, not getting mail was hurting, hurting the rat. The mission was to clear the several years of backlog. That's the mission for the six triple eight. What did they have to do? They had to work in very cold conditions because you know the war doesn't stop when it's cold. Okay, there was no air conditioning. 
no heating, okay? And they were working in buildings that you see like this one down here, okay? And because it was a war, the windows had to be blacked out. These here would all be blackout windows because the war was still going on and they didn't want, they didn't want anybody to see that they were working. This one, this one, this one is in France because they were in France too. And I'm going to move to France. Okay. <clears throat> so while they, when they, when the 800 and something women were nominated, got their orders, they were shipped in two, two different uh, uh, ships. The first one was the Elle de France. It left out of New York Harbor. That is the ship that Miss Rudolph was on, along with several other women that are located here. Left out of there. That ship crossed the Atlantic, was going to land in Birmingham, and because of German U-boats, and threat of being shot at, they had to divert it to Glasgow, Scotland. Glasgow, Scotland, the ship landed. Captain Adams and her executive officer, Captain Campbell, met the group there. Then they got on a train and took a train down to Birmingham. She had already come up with the plan of, okay, I've got to reduce this mail because she, knew, she already knew what she was up against. She decided, she came up with a plan. They're going to work seven days a week, three shifts, so that you work around the clock. Okay? There were three different shifts. The companies of the 6 AAA was headquarters company, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta. Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta were what we call the mail companies. Headquarters company was just what it was, the headquarters company. They did everything else, <laughs> okay? And these ladies started working to reduce the backlog. Now this mail, remember, it had sat for over two years. It was not readable. You'll see in some of the packages here that they were unwrapped because they had sat. And then, of course, if you have food, what happens when you got food? Oh, yeah, let me tell you, Miss Rudolph, she told this story. When she saw that mouth, she said, I'm done. <laughs> it is estimated that while in Birmingham, each ship worked and reduce the backlog by sorting at least about 65,000 pieces of mail per ship. Per ship, that's a lot of mail. I know the mail company knew they that. <laughs> and how many months they had? Six. 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 Guess what they did? They finished in three. I often tell people I would have loved to have been in the room with all of the white men, white men. When they figured out, you mean they don't finish this in three months? <laughs> well, I don't believe them. What did they do? <laughs> exactly. Leadership said, we don't see. Because remember, these were, these were predominantly black women. They the last on the totem pole. The army, the military was already kind of coming to grips with what grew? Tuskegee Airmen, because it proved that, oh, black men can actually fly an airplane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How about that? Mumphrey's Points Marines. Okay. Oh, you mean that? Yeah. The 404th all black female band. Yeah, a lot of people don't know. Yeah, that's another thing. Okay. Black people can, black women can play instruments. Yeah, black people can read and write too. Okay. 
because most of the women in the six triple eight already had high school diploma and a lot of them already had college educations. Okay. So what did leadership do? Oh, we, we got to make sure they actually did this. So they moved them from Birmingham, England to Rion, France. You look at a map and you see Paris go west, uh, kind of, yeah, northwest, west, and then kind of like in an angle. That's Rion, France. Rion is right smack in the middle of Paris to the east and Normandy to the west. That's where they were stationed at. And again, leadership gave them six months, okay? They had a little more help this time because again, war is starting to come to the end, okay? So they had the assistance of German POW, but all they were doing was helping lift these, these heavy bags because again, mail was being piled up, okay? People still not getting the mail, okay? They moved to Paris, France, uh, Rion, France to do the exact same thing. Charity Adams, who was now Major Adams, came up with the same plan. Three shifts, seven days a week. And again, working three shifts, seven days a week, estimated about 65 million pieces of mail that they cleared out. And guess what they did? Three months. Reduced the backlog in three months. It is estimated that this unit cleared about 7 million pieces of mail in the European theater of operation. The 6th Triple A was, was an army unit, so it still had army stuff to do. And they still had to do parades. They still had to do uh, army. We call it KP, kitchen, kitchen duty. Okay, still had to do that. That wasn't Miss Rudolph's fondest thing. Okay, but they were a unit that people was always coming to see. Okay. Because they was coming to see them because they heard it was some black women and remember where they were, okay, overseas. And a lot of white people had never seen black people, let alone black women. In fact, in Charity's book, this book, if you don't have it, go ahead and get it. It is an outstanding read. I've only I've read it three times. So you can see I got all my papers. Okay, now because where I got a paper at, that's one of my favorite parts. <laughs> okay. In this book, Charity asks, why were people wanting the wax to stay out past 11 o'clock at night? You couldn't figure that out until one person told them. Because they were told that after 11 o'clock, that the black wax who take. <laughs> That's what I said. Well, remember now, World War II, you remember? Tails, they grew tails. Yeah. And that's what they wanted to see. Okay? Remember, now, okay, I know y'all saying, what? Remember, this is through World War II, 1940, you know? I think people believe in King Kong at the time. Mm -hmm. All right. But that's what they did. But there was also tragedy. At Normandy, Normandy American Military Cemetery, I don't know if anybody's ever been there. It sits atop of the beaches. Okay. The top of that uh, cliff, I guess that's what you can call it, is Normandy American Cemetery. A lot of the service members that lost their lives that June 6 is buried right there. There are over 9,000 men buried there. Of that number, four are women. One was a Red Cross 
volunteer who was killed in a plane accident. Three, six to play. Now I'll tell you, I, I was in Normandy uh, in 2000. I was on this tour, I was stationed in, in Europe, went on this tour and we get to, we did all of the beaches, we get up to the cemetery. You know, I'm standing there because I'm, I'm just amazed. I'm just, and the caretaker comes up to me. He says, you know, there are three black women buried here. Now, I didn't know if he was just telling me that or was telling me that because I was the only black person in the group. Okay. He said, yeah, and they're from this male you. And he took me to each one of their grave sites. Now, in 2000, the only thing that I knew about the 6888 was, where's my photo? I had a photo of Charity Adams inspecting the troops. It is this photo here. This is the photo I always saw when I was in the military. And I would always say, I would always say, well, where is this human? Because this is the human I want to be in. Because all these women look like me. And I wasn't saying that for like five, six years. People let me walk around. Be this human here. Wasn't until like 1994, 95, when I said it, this guy said, you know, I think that's a World War II unit. I'm pretty <laughs> sure that that's a World War II unit. I was like, really? Really? And he said, yeah, I'm told. You got the uniforms. Like, oh, okay. Oh, so does the unit exist now? He said, no, that's World War II. Okay, in this photo is Indiana Hunt. Remember that. In this photo is Indiana Hunt Park, and I'm gonna tell you about her in a few minutes. Okay, so I'm, I'm like, wow. Okay. When I went to each of the graves, like I said, the guy took me to each of the graves. And I saw each other, each other women. One was, um, make sure I get their names correct. One was Dolores Brown. She was from New York. She survived the initial accident and succumbed to her uh, injuries about five days later. The other two, Mary J. Barlow and Mary Bankston died instantly. Now, the army, I guess, you know, maybe it was time, I don't, I don't know, would not send their bodies back to the United States for whatever reason, we don't know. So it was the members of the 6th Triple Eight that took up a collection to have these women funeralized and buried. In the unit of the 6888, there had been women that had had mortuary science experience. They had been funeral home attendants before they came into service. It was Captain Abby Noel Campbell who had to identify the bodies and be the model for the caskets. And this unit, took up money to have these women buried in the military arm. They are buried amongst veterans, heroes, which they are there at Normandy. If you ever get to Normandy, ask the caretaker to show you the graves of the, not only the 6888, but the only other woman that is there. When the 6888 finished their mission, they and Royal, they moved one more place and that was to Paris. Same thing, same mission. When they finished up their mission, it was February, 1946. A lot of them were starting to break down, get ready to come back to the States. When they did come back, a lot of them came to what was Fort Dix, New Jersey. It is outside of Philadelphia. It is also where I had basic training. 
there was no parade, no unit award. They thought, okay, y'all go home, do whatever you want to do. Okay. Miss Woodlock tells the story that they handed her a ticket. She took the train into Philadelphia, got on the train, came back home to Washington, D.C. Like many other veterans, did not talk about their service. Like the six triple eight, like Ms. Rudolph would always say, we did our job, served our country, now we can just go home, do something else. Many of them, they a lot of them, they had three choices. They could stay in the army, they could transfer to one of the other branches, or they could transfer out. A lot of them stayed on after duty. Some of them, like Mrs. McClendon, who's one of the living members, she's here. She transferred to the US Air Force because she had gotten married and her husband was in the Air Force. Of the living six members, she's the only one that is actually retired military. She is a retired major in that served in the US Air Force. They got home, a lot of them used their GI Bill. They went back to school, got degrees, got married, had kids, got second careers, went on with their lives, not talking about this. Until a man named Mr. Carlton Philpott. Now, Mr. Philpott does another story all by itself. If you ever see a fire and somebody's asking for some money, donating for some monuments, and it's got Carlton Philpott name down there, and you send a check with a letter saying, how can I help? Expect him to write you back a call because he's going to do it. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that's how he got me. <laughs> January 2018, somebody handed me a flyer. Hey, Liz, this is what you do. You know, there was a flyer that says, hey, collect the money. To build the six triple A a monument. Well, first of all, I already thought they had a monument. Okay. Uh, and the monument is going to be located out in the park of first African Americans, Buffalo Soldier Park, which is out at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Ninth and 10th Cavalry Association, point of contact, Carlton G. Philpott, US, US Navy. So yeah, I sent my check. Got my letter. Hey, Mr. I'm such and such, such, such How can I help? <laughs> That's what I said. <laughs> he calls me. Um, uh, that's Sergeant Hill version. This is Dr. Phil Park. Um, what I need you to do is you and this other lady that live in Laurel, Maryland, her name is Edna Cummings. You all can be the East Coast 6AAA monument team. I need you all to raise money. Now, this is January of 2018. So Ed and I, who didn't know each other at the time, we met. I live in Laurel on Main Street, and right across the street is Red Hot and Blue. That's where we met. Y'all know Red Hot and Blue. Like, well, that's where me and Edna met. And it was like, okay, Edna is retired on me. Edna is probably just as busy. As a matter of fact, she's doing something today. Okay. And we was going to raise money. Get the word out about the six triple eight, and then we don't go go back to doing whatever it is that we were doing. I often say that it's your plan, but God directs the step, and that's what He did. We said our little prayer, and then we started out. I will tell you that Stephanie, Cynthia, Dale is probably about four or five of them. They just got dragged on just <laughs> in association with me, and we started raising money. We had to raise 60,000. I think we were right at about 25,000 when I met Mr. Philpott. So and then I started. We went on radio shows, went to PXs, every kind of event that we could go to to raise money. By June, we had met that financial goal. In the meantime, Mr. Philpott, who lives out in Kansas, along with our, our researcher, Dominic Johnson, was searching for living members. At one time, there was 11 known members. Three of them, yeah, three of them lived right here in this area. 
Campbell, Miss Rudolph, and I think Miss Miss Hunt Martin had moved out. I get this call because now we're in the works. We're getting ready. They're going to get this monument built. Let me tell you, when you see a monument, that is the finished product. There is so much work behind getting that monument. Let me tell you. Okay. You, you wouldn't even believe what you got to do to get a monument. Built. Okay. I mean, it's just crazy. And this Phil Potts telling me, it's like, really, you got to ask people that you're going to donate the monument to to tell them that, hey, I want to donate this monument to you. Is that okay? You have to literally ask that question. Okay. This monument was for the 688 Central Postal Directory Battalion. There's a photo of it here, right here. The front of it and the back of the monument has a list of all of the names of the women by state in alphabetical order. Okay. What is so unique about this park first, it's a first, the park at first, African Americans. The first statue was the Buffalo Soldier Monument. A lot of people will know that one because the late Colin Powell threw his support on that. They have Flipper, uh, Henry Flipper, uh, I think it was last Wilson. He was the first African American to graduate from West Point. You have General Peterson. You have General Grissom. You have the 555, the 555 All Black Parachute Unit. You have the late Colin Powell. And you have the 6888 Central Postal Directory Battalion. As we say, the men are in good company now because the women have arrived. <laughs> <laughs> On that cold November day in 2018, there were five living members that attended that, that ceremony. And it was truly a great honor. My job that Ms. Philpott had me doing, and oh, by the way, Ms. Philpott will put you to work. Okay, August of 2018, he says, Liz, because now I'm Liz. Liz, I need you to go over to Mount Rainey in Maryland and tell PFC Rudolph that she will come to the dedication. I was like, okay, Mr. Philpott, did you say did you say she was like 94 and you want me to go over there and tell her she's gonna go? He's like, Yeah, you a master sergeant, she a PFC. I'm like, she's 94. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just go over there. She knows you're coming. So, you know, I called her, and, and I live in Laurel. She lived at the time in Mount Rainey. So, you know, I get over there, get parked, and I'm, and I'm coming down the sidewalk, and she's standing like where Stephanie's standing, and I'm walking, trying to find this place. She was, I heard this boy, hey, are you in Elizabeth? Yeah, I saw this person standing there. Hey, are you in Elizabeth? Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm Dolores. Okay, you know, well, actually, 94. <laughs> I was like, oh, you, you PFC Rudolph? Yeah. I was waiting on you call to call me. Come on, come on up to my place. She lived, and she lived on the top floor. <laughs> There's 17 steps. That's right, I counted. <laughs> so I thought about like, you live upstairs? She's like, yeah, she's in one of the older buildings, so it don't have an elevator, okay? She's like, oh, yeah, I, I come up and down three or four times a day. <laughs> so I was like, oh, look at puff, look at puff. No, we ain't getting there. And I was like, okay, well, Miss Rudolph, she was like, call me Dolores. I was like, okay, Miss Rudolph, <laughs> um, Mr. Bill Pop wants you to come. Um, she was like, I'm not going. I'm like, okay. This is a monument dedicated to your unit. She was just like, we just did our job. I don't need no monument. This is real special, okay? She was like, are you going? I was like, yes, ma'am. She said, okay, I'll tell you. She says, I hadn't been on a plane in 30 years. This was 2018. Been on a plane 30 years. I'll go if you go the same time I go and you're in the same room that I'm in. 
Hey, Mr. Philpott, she takes the phone from me. <laughs> She's like, Carlton Deluxe. I'm only going to go if Elizabeth goes at the same time and in the same room I am. So Mr. Philpott's like, oh, yeah, whatever you want. <laughs> so that started the relationship of me and Ms. Rudolph. Ms. Rudolph is also in the same Army Women's uh, chapter that Stephanie and I are both in. She was one of the longtime members, Northern Virginia Chapter 33, Women's Army Corps. Her birthday was September 16th. My birthday is September 14th. Her name is Dolores, spelled D-E-L-O-R-I-S, and my mother's name was Dolores, spelled D-E-L-O-R-I-S. E.S. Miss Rudock would say, well, everybody else spells very wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that was a relationship that I missed dearly. Miss Rudock died on March 27th of 2021. It was truly my honor to be there holding her hand, telling her it was all. One of the last things that she said to me, she asked me a question. She says, do you think that our unit is going to get the Congressional Gold Medal? And I said, Ms. Rudolph, if I've got to write every Senator, every House of Representative and have everybody that I know right, I'm going to ensure that your unit gets the six triple eight. And she said, I know that you will. And that was the last time that she talked. She went very peacefully. When we buried her April 20th of 2021, her burial, now this, we at the height of COVID, you know, she is actually at Baltimore National Cemetery, another sacred place. Her burial was attended by more than the 20 people that were supposed to be there. Well, it's not you know, because of COVID. Her burial was attended not only by Stephanie and Cynthia, Secretary of Veteran Affairs, Dennis McDonald, who had only been on the job six weeks, and Senator Moran out of Kansas, who was the person to why the 6 AAA has the Congressional Gold Medal. It was his idea that he planted in everybody else's hand and saying, yeah, I think this unit staff six have a congressional goal. That day he told us that the Senate had passed their bill. So all we had to do was work in the house. And on February 28th of 2022, the House of Representatives passed their portion of the six AAA Congressional Gold Medal Act. And on March 14th of 2022, President Joe Biden signed it into the six triple eight is the only military women, all women unit to have the U.S. Congressional Gold Medal. The WASP has a gold medal, but the WASP was in the WAAC. They did not have military status. That is the difference. The US Congressional Gold Medal, <clears throat> at the time I said was the highlight of it. Now, Etta and I keep saying, okay, we're gonna do this and then we're gonna go home and get back to our own business, okay? But the six triple eight is our business. I tell people I have two full-time jobs. I work at the Department of Veteran Affairs that pays me money. <laughs> And then I work for the six triple eight. It pays me so much more. Okay. And then behind that is Bourbon Presbyterian Church. You know, they, they work me too. Okay. But it has been my honor. <clears throat> Next month on April 27th of 2023, Fort Lee, Virginia, which is south of Richmond. Okay will be redesignated, is the name that they're using, redesignated to Fort Greg 
atoms. The atoms is cherry. Lieutenant General Gregg is 96, lives down in Manassas, still drives, okay? And he's real excited because he was a quartermaster officer. He's really excited about the installation being made after him and sharing it with Charity Adams. How about that? Charity Adams' son, Stanley, lives down here in PG County. I talked to him yesterday. He's kind of overwhelmed. Okay. Her daughter, Judy, lives up in Dayton, Ohio, which is where Charity Adams actually um, lived. She was married to Dr. Stanley Early uh, Senior. Just, you, you could do a whole story just on those two. Okay. Charity Adams died January of 2002. She's buried there in Dayton. Okay. And of course, now everybody wants to know about the six triple eight. We have accomplished our mission because one of the things that we started out by saying we just wanted to raise money for the monument and get the word out about the six triple eight. There are six living members. You have Miss Miss Romay Johnson. She's actually the oldest. And if you get the Smithsonian Magazine this month. She is on the cover on that, that two page. And I'm gonna tell you about that Smithsonian uh, article. They got like 12 pages, about six triple eight. That never happens. They do like two or three pages of a story and then that's it. Six triple eight got 12 pages, okay? Miss Romay, I saw her in uh, September, okay? She's kind of mad because they sold a car to keep her from driving. <laughs> uh, her birthday is in October. She's 103. She has a black belt that she earned at the age of 79. If you're from the South and you know the grocery store Winn-Dixie, okay, well, she worked at the Winn-Dixie in Montgomery to like, I need something. As a matter of fact, that's where they have a birthday party at in October, okay? <laughs> Miss uh, Fanny Griffith McClendon, she is the only one that is that is retired Air Force. She's a major. Uh, she's 102. Her birthday is September 22nd. Okay. She's kind of upset right now because she had an accident in October because the sun was shining in her face. She hit someone. No, no body was injured, but it totaled her car. And, and she's upset with the insurance company because the insurance company is not fixing her car. They told her. Okay. She's upset about that. Okay. So, you know, when I talked to her, she's like, you know, they're not fixing my car. I was like, yes, ma'am. All I can do is say yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, PFC Garcia. Mrs. Garcia is 102. She is the one that is of Puerto Rican descent. She lives in Brooklyn, New York. She was featured on uh, CBS this morning uh, last, last year uh, on their segment that they do in the morning. She was featured there. She talks about the 6888. While she was talking, she got a phone call right there on live TV. And the lady says, well, PFC Garcia, how are you? And she goes, you Dr. Biden. First Lady Jill Biden. Private Gladys Blunt. She's 101. She was in New Jersey. She now lives in Ruston, Florida with her daughter. Last summer, after her birthday, they named the street that she lived on. Gladys Eva Dubai Blunt Way. Okay. So she has a street named after her. She's pretty excited about that. Uh, like I said, she's 100. The other two living members, this is Corporal King, okay? This is her in her military picture. This is her on January 27th of 2023, and she is 100 that day. She's the diva of the group, Mrs. King. Um, what can I say about Mrs. King? You know, she just is. 
<laughs> okay, she was on the Today Show last year for her 99th birthday. Uh, her favorite newscaster is Al Roker. He did a series in their Life Well, well Left Live. I was actually there. She did a 55 minute interview and I wish so much that they could have shown that whole interview because she made it. She, along with Miss Catherine and Miss uh, McClendon are probably one of the better interviews. Mrs. King can talk in detail about her time in the six triple eight, okay? Stephanie and her daughter was there at her 100th birthday party. She loves parties. She's kind of disappointed because it wasn't a big hoo-ah, but she was uh, in the rehab center at the time, so we kind of had to steal it down, <laughs> okay? But she still showed up, you know, didn't want to use a cane, didn't want to use a walker, but no, I'm walking in now. Hey, man, whatever you want. Okay, I will be out there in April. I, I go out every couple of months. You know, she thinks I can just get on the plane and come on out here. So I will be out there next month. Miss Anna Mae Wilson Roberts. She is the youngest of the group. This is her March 5th of 2023 and she is 99 that day. She lives up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Please keep her in your prayers. She lost her only son March 12th uh, and their family is, is having his service today. It has been my honor to be here today. I thank Doc again for asking me. Um, what I want to do is I am going to present to this chapter, the national president, where is she at? Come on. Who's the national president? Come on. Because I, I, I appreciate Doc asking me to come share this story. I'm gonna challenge all of you to share the story. Ms. Rudolph, when she was asked the question, how do you pass it on? She says, you have to tell the story. And so I'm gonna ask this president, your chapter, to keep telling the story about the 6888 Central Postal Directory Battalion. And on behalf of the 6888 Living Veterans, all of the family members and supporters, we present this to you and say thank you for telling their story. We appreciate your support and ask you to keep passing it on. Thank you. Thank you. It's a very inspirational note. <laughs> um, no, thank you. And for my my uh, church mate, my encourager, but you know sometimes Irwin Irwin can be very difficult. Dot <laughs> 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 uh, has uh, and Dot and I met when she first came to to the church. Instant instant. Um, connection and always encourage me. Uh, you know, I, I had a lot of people writing letters, calling, faxing, Facebooking, all of the senators and representatives to get this bill passed. You know, um, I was always sending letters. That's why I don't know why the post office went up on stage. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but not only is it the, the six triple eight, but like she said, I do walk for cancer. And uh, I'm the founder of the cancer uh, the Walk to Cure Cancer Tour. Uh, there were five of us. I'm the oldest. We lost my brother that's right behind me, April 26th of 2018, which was 16 months after my mother died. We lost my brother, Johnny, who was a uh, Army veteran. Uh, we lost him from Nons Hopkins lymphoma. Okay, So that is one of my causes. Uh, and the church all knows. In fact, they all ask me, what's the next walk? Uh, and so I uh, appreciate the support that they give me in that uh, because I believe in my heart that cancer will be cured. We just have to get the funds to research so that research can find that cure. So from all of the 6 members, the family members, donors, supporters, to DOT, 
she doesn't have this this photo. This photo is of the five members that attended the uh, ceremony on November of 2018. It is the five living members. Each of their signatures is real. That is their signature, along with the photo of, of them surrounding that, that monument. I'm gonna give this to Doc. Thank you so much. Very question. So I'm taking my hat off. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes. Good afternoon or good morning, ladies. My name is Jackie Nichols. I'm a resident here. And I certainly thank Joyce for inviting me to this gathering. Mm -hmm. I'm a retired military army nurse who are retired. And um, I have to say that I did know of the six triple eight. And I did some research in the past. And I'm also a member of the National Association of Black military women, NABMW, you know, and um, I, I, I'm from New York, Brooklyn, New York, oh, and I told the story about the 688 at the Harlem chapter, certainly not as extensive as Elizabeth did, uh, but I do know of them, and as a matter of fact, I did a, a brief presentation right. here yeah. um, um, about yeah. the 688, mm -hmm. and the organization that I belong to, which is the National Association of Black military woman takes pride in continuing the legacy of the six triple eight. By our motto is tell her, tell her story, mm -hmm. to tell her story. And most of us are registered with the um, National Military Museum in Harlem, oh. in Arlington, that is, you know. and where we are documenting our actual story that we have actually done in the military. Oh, so thank you for the invitation. Yeah. Thank, or, you. thank you for or, your service. Yes. Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. sure you know Pat Jackson Kelly. Oh, yes, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah she's telling me. Yes, yeah. yes, absolutely. And um, Pat's not going to make it next next month, uh, but General Retired Claire Adams yes, Ender, Ender. Yes, she, yes, she will be there, but yes. we will be there together on that Wednesday. Okay. Yes. Uh, the 6888 has a scholarship that uh, we are proud of. Because the 6888, a lot of them, when they got out, they used their GI Bill to go back to school. Ms. Rudolph was a proponent of education. She used her GI Bill to go back to school to what? To Talladega Fashion Institute, which is now New York Fashion Institute. Okay. Uh, got a degree in fashion, actually won a couple of awards. But then when she graduated, of course, she couldn't find a job, so she had to go in the bank. But a lot of them used their GI Bill to go back to school. Last May, May of 2022, uh, General Claire Adams and her retired, who's a US, who's Navy, I mean, a uh, Army. Army nurse. And Edna Cummings and I established the 6 AAA Legacy Scholarship with mm -hmm. the Army Women's Foundation because mm -hmm. they already have uh, scholarships. They manage scholarships. So that's why we went under that umbrella. And I and Edna Cummings are actually board members on that, that board. Uh, we established that scholarship. That was May of 2022. January of 2023, the scholarship had reached $10,000. We will award the first scholarship next week, March 22nd, at the Army Women's Foundation Hall of Fame and Special Recognition Ceremony, where Mr. Philpot, who's a Navy person, will get honored by Army Women's for his contributions. And a contribution is a light word for what he has done four to six triple eight and that was the idea of Lena Bell King and all I did was wrote it up for him okay and he was selected the six triple eight was selected to their army women's hall of fame in the class of 2016. Stephanie was inducted last year in the class of 2022 and I was inducted in the class of 2020 because of our work and what we did with the six triple eight. Okay, so May, I, I'm gonna give you give you this right here. Thank you, sir. Oh, thank you. Uh, would okay. you introduce yourself, please? Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
thank you for a wonderful presentation. I can tell you live what you say. Thank you. I'm Barbara Baskerville, a resident here. I'm a retired colonel in the Army Nurse Corps. And uh, we are delighted that you are here. Uh, Claire Adams Ender is my fellow alum from North Carolina a &T, oh! and so I know her quite well. Yeah. Just say so Sergeant thank, Liz. That's yeah. how she is. Thank you so much for being here and thank Joyce for inviting me. Oh, all right, let's see you tell us about uh, Claire that I, I can't get, okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She's another one that called me up. Sorry. I know, yeah. I know. Uh, Melissa, would you please stand? Melissa is the president of our African American History Club here at Riderwood. And she is the one who got Jackie for one of our programs about the six triple. Thank you. Thank you. One of the other things I don't think she touched on um, this is the brochure that advertised the documentary that is in, I call it the gang. <laughs> we put together a documentary that actually was shown at the Greenbelt, the old Greenbelt Historical Theater. And uh, a lot of our church members and friends went to this wonderful presentation uh, that they did a documentary. Yeah. And I sure hope it's on uh pbs and stuff well it, it's uh so the documentary that she's talking about is from my uh good friend jim Fayes. he also works at va he works in the national cemetery administration um he is a filmmaker hobby he makes films by hobby he's made three films uh one of them is the hello girls the hello girls were world war one okay uh and Hello means they were telephone operators and they were recruited by, uh, again, army men to do a job, to translate, okay, be translators on the phone, okay. The difference is they did not get military status. When World War I was over with, it was about, oh, okay, we'll go home, see you, okay. Um, there was a long fight to get these women uh, military status. And, and unfortunately, uh, they all died uh, before that could happen. But the late Corky Roberts uh, was one of the supporters in trying to get them. Jim did a documentary on the Hello Girls. He also did a documentary on the 30th of May. It's about African-American male soldiers. And he's, he's on this one. This is the one that uh, we did November of 2018, where we had all of the five living members there. Uh, if you get a chance, go to his uh, website. It's called Lincoln Penny Films. It's right here, Lincoln Penny Films. You can download it or, or go in and, and purchase, purchase it. One of the things that I was so impressed with, with the document was the primary sources, primary documents and some primary video that was taken during the war that incorporated yeah. the women in it. I mean, it was just phenomenal. Uh, the, the, the instruction that could be given in a classroom through primary source documentaries that was used within this particular uh, movie that was put together. Mm -hmm. Just fantastic. There's a lot of it's uh, your names on this. Yeah. One of the producers. Yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, footage in the archive. Yeah. And it's it's free to the public. You can go in and ask for it. Thank you so Great. much Thank you for coming and inspiring us and showing us things we never knew. Mm -hmm. And exactly. hopefully we will. Just plain, we will. Um, I want everybody to please take advantage of our hoodies and stick around. Um, look at all the pictures. And I was looking at the books. I'm going to take a picture. Maybe try to get those books myself. And I, I have some posters that you can take. And and you you can take one of these postcards. You might know somebody on the postcard. <laughs> 
Okay, but don't don't take none of my books. <laughs> Those that have the mail, the mail, I I will tell who has the son that's going. Okay, so you have your son. Make sure you all like. Yeah, just please write them. I know Google, I mean Facebook, Twitter, you know, all that other kind of technology. Yeah, we have all of that. But when you write a letter, you send a card, it makes a whole different thing. Okay. So please do. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> um, so downloaded. Yeah. 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 Yeah.